My name is Sarah Brown Campello, and I'm the Network and Programs Coordinator here at WINGS. If you're unfamiliar with WINGS, WINGS is a global network of over 100 philanthropy associations and support organizations in over 40 countries around the world whose purpose is to strengthen, promote, and provide leadership on the development of philanthropy and social investment. Our vision is of a strong global philanthropic community that, give, that strives to build more equitable and just societies around the world. Today's webinar will be about this Giving to Myanmar, a guide for Asian philanthropists. And without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Stacy from the Asia Philanthropy Circle. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you so much, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for attending this first collaboration between APC and WINGS. To give a little context, uh, APC is a membership platform for Asian philanthropists to jointly grow the impact of their philanthropy. Um, Sorry, Sarah, could you? Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, so we first started this series of uh, cross-border giving guides because we recognized that there was a gap in the market for a practical toolkit for philanthropists and other funders to help them give and contribute effectively. So we identified a few of the trickiest countries that our members are currently interested in and struggling with. The first country featured in this series is Myanmar. We are also in the process of releasing a guide to China, a giving guide to China. The guides provide a landscape review of the country, including recommendations from experienced practitioners on the ground relating to the regulatory framework, cultural issues, sources for information and case studies. It is not meant to provide extensive information into each area, but we do give some suggestions on where you can go for more information. Um, Maybe we can move to sorry, the part uh, with our website. Yeah, well, so for those of you who have not read the guide, please download it from our website. Our resources are meant to be freely available so that we can spread the impact. Um, beyond this guide, you can also find many other research and reports uh, on our website for download. Okay, so for today, we have invited our main researcher and writer for the guide, Ms. Dian Yuan, to present on the key findings from the guide. We also have two of APC's partners in Myanmar who would share some insight from the ground in working with foreign funders and what they would like you to know better. Okay, I would like to pass the time now to Dian, who can fill us in on the highlights of the research, then open to Misu and Chosua from the Inlay Heritage Foundation. We will then, uh, from what I understand, open for Q&A after this, so please do direct your questions to the three speakers after. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, Dan. Could you speak up a little bit? Sure. Uh, so Closer to the microphone. So before I jump in, I'd like to acknowledge that while I was the main researcher and writer, several other researchers and editors um, did help shape the report and took it to the final stages. So I, I'd like to say a big thank you for their work. Um, I want to also disclose that I worked on this report when I was an independent philanthropy consultant before joining Evercore, um, but it's nice to be able to come back and help share this report. So as Stacey alluded to, um, as Stacey alluded to, we wanted to provide a practical tool for foreign donors as they begin um, or they want to expand their giving to Myanmar. So we wanted to answer, like address some of the questions such as what do I need to know if I want to support projects, where do I start, who do I talk to, and how can I be successful. So if you take a look at the guide, um, the first section of the report actually gives an overview of topics most likely to influence private philanthropic giving, you know, such as the infrastructure that you're working within, the political stability, the regulatory transparency, and some of the demography. Um, the second section looks at topics that donors should consider and most likely will encounter when making grants or when you're implementing projects. Um, finally, we share some recommendations from our interviews and research that consistently came up. Um, so let me start by saying that on slide one, um, 
These are topics that donors should be familiar with that may help form their structure, the form, and also their philanthropic strategy once they start thinking about Myanmar. Um, if you don't know, I'm just going to give a quick history of Myanmar. It was under military rule beginning in 1962. The decades that follow that, there was a regime that practiced isolationism um, and abused it. And then basically we had sanctions from the international community. Along with the corruption and poor governance, the country was basically in a downward economic spiral. But in 2008, um, amongst tragedy, the cyclone NARS just struck the country. It was caused widespread destruction, and the government agreed to basically open its doors for international aid efforts. So many saw this event as a milestone. It was a turning point for the country to consider reform, and the growth of the nonprofit sector actually um, started growing. So during this time, groups like the Local Resource Center actually started um, they were coordinating the disaster relief work, but since then these groups have evolved and now are wonderful resources for us, um, for NGOs to connect. You can recruit staff, they have a job site, and then you can also access a lot of professional development tools. So a lot of these um, resources left over from the Cyclonarges area are still alive and they're viable um, and they're still very active. So I definitely encourage you to visit some of these um, links that we provide in the report. So under the economic growth and development, many of you know, you know, Myanmar is flourishing right now, it's open doors. Um, the 2016, we have a new civilian leader, um, and a lot of reforms were enacted. So these reforms actually sparked a lot of foreign investments into the country, um, especially in infrastructure around transportation and energy. Um, starting a business is much easier now in Myanmar. Um, there's changes in laws and processes. It reduces a lot of barriers to entry. Travel to Myanmar is also much easier. So donors, foreign donors, can go in the country and conduct learning trips and visits to grantees and manage the progress of your work. Um, now what I found fascinating was in 2017, uh, Myanmar had approximately 46 million active mobile subscriptions. That's 46 million active mobile subscriptions, and there are 54 million people in the country. So basically, it's amazing how many it just grew. Um, and many users spend about 2.4 hours online each day with Facebook, accounting for 60% of their online time. So Facebook is the dominant source of information right now in Myanmar and one in two of all active cell phones have Viber. So what this means is if you're thinking about ways to do outreach in Myanmar, it's hard to ignore the social media and mobile technology um, notifications. And the, another big issue for Myanmar is 34% of Myanmar's population live in urban areas. Um, but urban services are severely lacking, and in fact, power outages are frequent, so disrupting both individual and commercial activity. Another thing to consider if you're thinking about working long term in the country, um, especially living conditions. So, and tourism and environment have become ongoing concerns. Um, there, there has been a big increase in tourism and new hotels and facilities were built, but the overbuilding has caused a lot of environmental and heritage concerns. Um, the cost of food, lodging, and property in the major cities, especially in Yangon, have increased substantially. Um, so if you're thinking about doing work in Myanmar, you might also want to take a look at the cost of living there. Um, it's not cheap. So, but social enterprises like the Inlay Heritage Foundation, um, they're supporting sustainable tourism projects. So I think that's actually a new trend and it's quite interesting um, to take a look at, especially in the social enterprise space. Um, so on slide two. Um, so the topics on this slide is important for donors to understand if you want to scale your programs or work within particular regions or groups. Um, and this is actually quite interesting. I, I found that um, in, in, it's very specialized for Myanmar. Um, even if your most thought through well-intentioned programs, um, it may negatively interfere with some of the local power struggles and dynamics. So I would encourage a lot of the funders and donors to be really sensitive um, about working in Myanmar. So it is one of the most culturally diverse countries in Asia. 
The government officially recognizes 135 national races, um, but it's important to note that this figure is controversial and heavily contested by ethnic minorities, um, as they believe it does not accurately represent the true identities. So the Bamara Burman people make up majority of the Myanmar population, that's about 68%, and then the other 32 are other ethnic groups. Um, it's quite diverse. So the ethnic groups live mainly in seven states. Um, they're named after the largest ethnic groups in them, and you see them listed there, the Kain, the Chin, the Kachin, and so on. So poverty in these ethnic areas are actually quite high. So if you take a look at the national poverty rate in 2010, it was about 26%, but just in Chin State alone, they're at 73%, um, and they were kind of states at 44%. So lots of needs in those areas. Um, we have about 111 living languages, but many dialects. Um, Burmese is spoken by about 65% of the population as their first language. So what this means is that if donors are interested in replicating projects in different regions in the country, especially those involving education training, you have to engage with various local people with different language capabilities. So this is something that you may want to keep in mind as you're thinking about um, program strategy implementation. So, moving on to about the conflict and ethnic tensions. Um, in 1948, the Burmese-led administration attempted to bring all the population under its control, um, but there was a conflict between the administration and some of the ethnic armed groups. So fighting broke out and it continued until October 2015. There was a national, nationwide ceasefire agreement that was signed, but unfortunately, seven ethnic groups did not sign the agreement, uh, including two of the largest militias. So fighting continues on, and this is something, if you're going to work in the country, that you should be really familiar about. Um, so the ethnic groups recognized by the government are provided citizenship under the 1982 citizenship law, but certain groups were denied citizenship and this includes the Rohingya population in Rakhine State. Um, and more to follow on that too. So if we look at the ethnic-based um, civil society groups, so all these um, groups in these ethnic areas, um, there's 20 independent ethnic armed organizations or EAOs that operate in Myanmar. So some groups like the Kachin, Man, and Karen groups have developed their own kind of civil administration, so basically their own government. Um, they oversee land and health and education in their own territories. And they also created a lot of these social organizations to serve their own ethnic groups um, and their independent entities. So the governance in these ethnic areas are complex. Um, it's mixed and sometimes overlapping authority. So if you're working in these areas, you have to be conscious about the governance in the area. Um, in some of these areas, some people may be subject to two different administrations, the central government and the EAOs. So if you're trying to get a permit or if you're trying to get you know, a license to work in an area, you have to be sure who you're basically working with. So donors wishing to support programs in land, agriculture, like infrastructure projects, transportation, energy and tourism, especially in these arms, um, ethnic controlled areas, you have to be really sensitive of local dynamics. Um, the Asia Foundation and the Myanmar Center for Responsible Business have a lot of research in these areas, and I would encourage you to take a look at their materials. Um, they're quite good. So in terms of education, um, this is a very popular issue area that many donors support. Lots of opportunities in Myanmar for them to do so. So because of the decades of underspending in education, there's been a lot of inadequate infrastructure, shortage of teachers, overcrowding, um, basically no textbooks and no supplies. So government has made education a national priority, so they are working on this. Um, but the significant gap in the system is this failure to support children from all the ethnic groups. So Burmese and English are the main language of instruction and examination, but little Limited progress is made, made for like the mother tongue based multilingual education, which is actually really critical in the early stages um, for the children. 
So if you are working on education, then you should be aware that control over education policy is really sensitive for ethnic groups um, as it's a means for cultural survival. So basically language is really connected to their identity, culture, and belonging. So you want to be really sensitive in working around that. Um, and slide three. I'm going to jump into some of the highlights, um, that the issues that donors will most likely encounter when you're making a grant or working in Myanmar. Um, so local philanthropic trends, uh, they've always had a rich culture of philanthropy, largely formed by religious traditions and culture. Um, many give to temples, pagodas, um, school construction projects. It's an act of merit making, but you know, since 2014, Myanmar was actually at the top of the CAF, the Charities Aid Foundation World Giving Index. Um, they stayed there for a couple of years, but in, in it's the world's most philanthropic country. But in 2018, though, Myanmar dropped to the ninth place. Um, and CAF uh, attributes the drop to the Rohingya crisis, having contributed to Myanmar's people being less willing to give or, or less willing to help or volunteer, help a stranger or volunteer. But the new influx of this new philanthropic practices from overseas, um, it's influencing the evolving local giving landscape, especially the returning diaspora. Um, there's a huge use of online social networks. Corporate philanthropy is growing and social enterprises are also growing and they all add to this growing awareness of philanthropy. Um, especially the formal philanthropy. So oh, the couple of laws have been passed. Um, the most recent one was the July 2014 the Association Registration Law. Um, it basically allows for nonprofits or NGOs, uh, local NGOs, to register um, and you can apply at any level depending on your geographical location of your activities. Um, INGOs or um, international NGOs must apply for registration at the union level, which is the national level, um, and then they have the additional step of signing an MOU with the counterpart ministry. Um, I've heard mixed reviews. Some say it's quite easy. Some say it's difficult. Um, but the registration, once you get the registration, it's good to have because then you can open a bank account, you can collect donations, um, and you can even own property. So. And there's been some new corporate foundations being created. Um, I hear that's the new trend. But they tend to be run by families that own the business, um, and they implement their programs, and not really a grant maker. Um, so completing due diligence is another issue for donors. Um, it's difficult to gather and verify information of Myanmar-based groups um, to assess their reputational risk and also to comply with anti-money laundering regulations if you're sending money from overseas. Um, lack of government records and media reports, you know, make the fact-finding process really difficult. So expect to spend some additional time and resource on this um, to verify the data. Some of the donors I've spoken to reported having to hire investigators to get information um, beyond the public domain. So historically, a lot of the groups um, that work in Myanmar do not keep financial records because many of the deals are done in cash. Um, so, you know, donors should be aware that asking them to open their books, to capture receipts, or to prepare an organizational program budget. Um, this is quite new for them, but things are changing. Um, and, and there's been a lot of ask from a lot of other donors. So they're working on this too. Um, but along the same lines, you know, local capacity in the financial accountability, reporting, and systems management Again, it's underdeveloped, so there needs to be additional training in these areas. Um, so I, I would ask you just to be really patient if you're working with a lot of local NGOs. Um, it takes a lot of education, a lot of explaining, um, and just you know try try and give them examples of what you're looking for. So, and in terms of corruption and transparency. Um, you know, Myanmar has a problem with this um, on the Transparency International Corruption Perception Index. It's always been, the country has always been ranked very low. Um, there was an anti-corruption law that was passed in 2013 to tackle the problem, but transparency in the NGO sector is still an ongoing concern. Um, but hopefully with the new association law reporting requirements, 
it'll curtail some of the abuses. Um, but the sector is also stepping up. Um, they're volunteering submitting information about their work to Mohinga or Myanmar's aid information management system. And that link is also in the report, but definitely recommend that you go visit Mohinga. It's a great site. Um, anyone can, once you access it, you could search by development partner activity, you can look at the sector, and it'll give you the total commitments and disbursements um, that's been made at any given time. So you can even find you know, who the donor is and where they're working. It's a great site, and I think it's a first step towards the transparency process. Um, next is to talent in the sector. Quality talent is still a problem. Um, you know, there's the supply, and there's not much of a, there's a lot of demand, not, <laughs> and not enough supply. So they're competing, basically good people are, you have to compete with other INGO, and then you have the resources that the private sector has to offer, which is really hard to compete with. So higher compensation, you know, ability to move up, training, job stability, they're just all really attractive. So it's really hard to keep um, talent in the NGO sector, uh, especially with all this influx of foreign, you know, groups coming in. So uh, one, one of the interviewees mentioned that there are very few professional executive training and mentoring programs inside Myanmar right now for civil society leaders. Um, so he's suggesting that donors may want to ensure that local staff are paid fairly um, and are participating in some of these programs. And, and he's encouraging also to establish a pipeline. And this with um, staff and capacity training um, kept coming up in the interviews, um, and, and people kept mentioning that how important it was. So slide four. Um, in this section, talking about some of the recommendations from our interviews and research, and these are ones that consistently surfaced up, so I thought it would be good to highlight some of them. Um, a lot of the donors see the country as full of promise and opportunity, but it's still evolving. Um, few folks use the word cautious optimism, um, and that seems to be the general feeling, given the internal ethnic conflict and some of the human rights violations that need to be addressed. So a lot of the fellow philanthropists recommend that they need to keep basically abreast of the issues that affect their work. Um, you know, start doing a lot of research, keep digging in. Um, there's some research that's also already available that you might want to take a look at. Um, the Myanmar Information Management um, Group, Unity Group, and my MIMU, um, has some really good research up on their website that's free. So across the board, the philanthropists um, that we spoke to recommended that donors spend a long time in Myanmar. They said it's not a country you could just drop in and work. Um, you have to consistently visit. Um, you have to go see the organizations, talk to the local leaders, um, and it requires a lot of direct, consistent involvement. And as one of the interviewers said, you have to peel back the layers and ask a lot of questions. Um, and in order to do that, you have to be there face to face to really get the answer um, that you're kind of looking for. So the other is uh, another best practice is to kind of work with local groups to support local, local solutions. Um, because of all the complexity in the cultural language, um, you need to find local groups that are culturally competent. Right, they have to speak that local language if you want them to help you implement programs. Um, local groups have a deep understanding of how things work in the community, and it's really important because they know the local dynamics um, and the leadership and who's in charge, um, and that's really, really important. It's not very evident. Um, and they also have the tenacity and dedication to really serve their constituents. Um, others recommended that funders look at um, especially those working in conflict areas, you need to be really sensitive of the funding partners that you're, that they can actually work in that community um, and that they actually have some uh, kind of background in that area and they're not just dropping in to do a project. So, you know, building local capacity was all over the place. Um, a lot of people recommended that. Um, and then one thing that kind of struck me was, and I, I didn't expect this, um, the don't, one of the, a couple of the donors talked about ethnic discrimination in the NGO sector. Um, so ethnic discrimination is an issue 
even by those working in the NGO sector. And their base, their biases are not readily apparent to outsiders. Um, a lot of the distrust and misperceptions continue to persist with some of the local staff, but must, mostly filled by historical and cultural assumptions. So basically, donors need to be aware that this exists. And you have to be really sensitive to, to the interactions between the staff and the beneficiaries who are from different ethnic backgrounds. Um, so that was interesting for me. Um, the other is uh, local NGO boards. Um, they kept saying that a lot of local NGO boards kept recruiting uh, like-minded, like friends that grew up together, familiar with each other to sit in the board. Um, the problem is it makes it really difficult for them to question practices and expand their reach. Um, so a couple of the donors have recommended that local NGO boards do get some board training um, and then try to find a diverse, a diverse type of board um, with different backgrounds. Um, foster collaboration was another one. Um, they like taking the more the merrier approach. Um, they thought that giving, especially in Myanmar, it's much better to give as a community instead of, you know, giving from an individual. So a lot of the donors I spoke to really wanted to work together. Um, sustainability was another one that kept coming up. A lot of the donors recommended that you should avoid quick wins, but really focus on strengthening the groups that you're working with. Um, and a lot of them actually encourage unrestricted gifts, um, giving flexibility, um, especially for community building work and also board training. Board training also kept coming up too. Um, so finally, um, the other board, being patient was a big thing. You know, it's unexpected delays are gonna occur. Um, programs aren't gonna go the way that you want it to go sometimes. Um, and it's a rapidly evolving government and social ecosystem. So you have to kind of, you know, take it in stride. Um, and working with the government takes time. It's not overnight. Um, and also be really sensitive of local practices, such as, you know, th they don't like email. They prefer to do Viber or they do group chats. So when foreign donors expect emails and forms and everything to be sent back in a PDF um, version, um, that might not be the best way. It might take them a little bit longer to answer that way. But I think if you get on Viper or WhatsApp, it's much easier um, to get the answers that you need. So that concludes um, my presentation and open to questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dan. Um, I was thinking that we could uh, move on to get some feedback uh, with uh, Misu and Choshua so that uh, they can give some perspectives and insights about their experience working on the ground as locals with foreign funders and also maybe some thoughts on how they feel about this guide. Um, so could we have Misu first? Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? I think if you could be a bit louder, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'll try to speak louder. Okay. Um, yes, well, thank you. Thank you for um, for listening or discussing or about how to help my country. So first of all, thank you. And uh, I think that, um, you know, I, I, I read already the guidebook uh, because you, um, Stacey handed over a couple of months ago. And I was very impressed, first of all, because I, I've never seen such guidebook and I even learn about my own country <laughs> because um, I was saying that most of us are living in some isolated area. Um, the fact that I'm, I'm from Shan State, I, I live in Indy Lake and we don't really sometimes commute with other part of the country because that's the way we lived before and now it's all about network and and you know meeting up people and this is quite new to all of us. So when um, uh, Diane uh, cover about you know how to uh, your presentation covered it very well that this is a very um, complex country and uh, patient uh, you name you, you talk about it uh, listening and the the our behavior our mindset uh, you had covered it pretty well um, with the guidebook uh, to go back on the guidebook as I I was uh, I was saying that. 
I for me was um, it's uh, we don't know how to uh, present it. Sometimes we do things, but we don't know how to put it in a in a good presentation or a PDF or a PowerPoint or a guidebook like you had done. So uh, it's interesting and uh, it's a. Uh, Although that we think that we know about our country, when you put it in that kind of perspective, we also learn a lot from a report that is done by the foreigner coming to this country. However, um, like Jan, Jan said, it absolutely needed to be culturally sensitive. This is a country that is opening up not too long ago, although that um, uh, you know, the world seems to be moving very fast. In reality, for us, it's like it is a, a closed country opening up even a couple of years, it cannot change that quick because the mindset coming from our uh, uh, invisible culture barriers or our education system that has been poorly managed for the past five, six decades, so that we stay paying a very expensive price to cope up with the rest of the world. Although that uh, we have a, a lot of uh, internet or mobile coverage and people can have a smartphone, um, we still struggled how to use it in the most um, um, useful way or uh, effectively. Um, and uh, so it, it, it is challenging. However, it's, it's also very fulfilling to work in this country. The fact that a lot of things is to, to, uh, to, to, um, to start. And so there is a lot of, of, of field that we can um, we can focus on. It's not only limited in education or in peace or in in uh, healthcare or um, or um, you know um, interface on you know many uh, area to cover. So uh, there is a lot of room for a lot. However, I really would like to uh, reuse again the recommendation of the end that it absolutely needed to listen to the local community and. And when we say local community, you, as uh, as you as you know all, that this is uh, not only one uh, minority; it's full of minorities, and they, we speak several different language, and people don't understand to each other that that much. So it needed to listen well and help us to identify what we are good at. You know, so we we feel like sometimes we need a lot of facilitation program from as help in order to find ourselves. We need to understand what we want and what we are good at and what we are not good at and try to keep on things that we can do and things we cannot where we have to learn. So you've got to give us a little bit of time to cope up uh, with the rest of the, 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 the world. And so listening to us is important because we are, uh, to be honest, we are very, uh, either we are overconfident because we are local and we think that we know things, Either sometimes we also feel like we have very lack of confidence, especially conf lack of confidence in self. That also comes from lack of um, critical thinking and practice of giving feedback or taking feedback due to our education system and cultural barriers. So what happened is that we are uh, we, we, we the country opened up, but it's true that we have very few skillful labor or skill skillful person. Not because we don't have a lot of young people, we do, but we need to practice this. This is a process. Uh, transformation takes time. So when people come and help us, it is also important to be to listen, to be patient, and identify what we are good at and what we're not good at, and guide us through this. We can do it. You know, this is. This, uh, we have talent, and uh, I really believe that we can do it. We we didn't. Uh, I'm in the in the in the uh, vocational education for the past five years. I've seen. Uh, I had uh, raised the bar very low. Return. I I expect maybe ten percent of um, the outcome of what I had invested, but because not to disappoint myself, so I give. And we try to give as much as we can and we expect the least, but actually by doing that, I also realize that after five years, it's more than what we expect. And I feel like uh, our, um, our project has been, it's not all perfect, but at least 70-80%, uh, uh, I'm very grateful that what we had done. But So patient is important, identify what we are good at and what we're not good at so that you can help us along. On the other hand, it's also please uh, we have to be aware that do no harm in helping. Uh, sometimes over willing to help 
it hurt you, it hurt us as well because so it doesn't provide some kind of um, um, how could I say that uh, sustainable um, um, kind of uh, uh, program. And when the funding cut, you leave, and then people have to continue to live. How? And so this is important to have this sustainable um, project um, and that kind of uh, planning uh, ahead. On the other hand, also there are many, many, many NGOs coming in. People are doing. Well, we sometimes are skeptical about NGOs, to be honest, because so we feel like there is so or sometimes only one group is helping, the other group is not helping. And so people mistrust. When people mistrust of themselves already, and other people are helping only to one particular group or not another group, that is difficult. That's why it's important to communicate. Um, otherwise, uh, the skeptical or mistrust of people will, will do more harm than good. And uh, sometimes also we feel like many NGOs come and interview, 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 and they're all doing the same thing. But they seem doesn't like they don't coordinate each other. It's also a lack of um, from our government side or not having a platform where we could see who is doing what already so that you don't need to repeat the same thing. We, you can also exchange to each other information as much as you can so that you don't waste your time and money and and you know don't, don't need to uh, repeat the uh, same thing question to the local. So um, I think that it's important or to know who are already on the ground and exchange it. Um, another thing also is that uh, yes, uh, education, when we talk about education project, of course, this is for the long term. Meantime, people need to eat and, and uh, you know, survive right now. So long term plans and long term projects are good. It, it needed to be doing this way. However, the short term, so, so, uh, in order to help people to gain a skill, to learn something, earn or, and be financially independent is also important. So when it comes to long-term plan, don't forget also in short term that uh, that you need we need to deliver something in order to keep hope for people to keep moving. Um, so that's for the moment what I have in mind uh, listening to to Dan and uh, Daisy uh, guys. So. Um, well, uh, this is for what I would like to add for the moment. I, I don't know if um, George wants to start, and then we can also um, answer and uh, if there are questions, of course. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Sue. Um, Chosa, maybe uh, if you can just add on a few lines, we have a couple of minutes for you. At the same time, I'd like to remind everyone, uh, if you have questions for any of our three speakers, you can type into the chat window uh, so that we can address this. Uh, and the speakers can also prepare to answer your questions uh, once we open up. Thank you. Uh, so, Chosa? Hi. Hello, yes. everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you for all your participation and uh, listening to all the great speakers ahead of me. And uh, I'd like to add a, a few more things uh, with our country. And uh, first of all, thank you so much for your interest in our country. And uh, based on beyond presentation that you might heard about the discrimination or the distrust among uh, the people, so I just want to add a bit uh, more about the historical issues. The, the country was uh, over 100 years uh, under British and uh, uh, under the colonization and also uh, we were uh, we were uh, under the civilian government only a few days and then we were many decades under military so uh, none of uh, under any uh, government uh, we couldn't really uh, build uh, kind of uh, to live in harmony or to really believe in the diversity and so on so we always uh, or uh, doubt each other and due to the uh, very uh, diverse uh, ethnicities and so on. So this is uh, one of the first points that I want to uh, add on to the uh, previous uh, historical issues that is resulting to uh, today um, the difficulty in building trust uh, in our country. And the second thing is, uh, you know, the country was changed in 2011 or 12, and then later on it kept changing. So we, we, we kind of uh, see that the, the speed of the change in the country. Uh, about 20 years ago, we uh, the SIM card that we use today, was that we had to buy, like paying more than 1,500 USD to buy one SIM card. 
-hmm. And then it, it dropped down gradually to uh, 500 US dollar about 10 years ago. And then now we pay only one dollar a month, uh, one dollar for one SIM card. So this kind of change that you could imagine in the past, the country was entirely closed and monopolized for many economic uh, opportunities and so on. But now it is uh, fairly open to, to anyone. And uh, on the other hand, the internet coverage is already uh, presented by DNZ. About more, 40 over a million people are in the coverage of the social media and so on. So uh, linking with the, uh, the poor education system and uh, with the uh, distrust um, in, in the past, uh, that has also been a huge impact uh, how difficult to be working uh, in, the, in the country. So I, I just want to keep you in, bear in mind that to be also be prepared with these kind of things. And on the other hand, our people, uh, you know, the, the, the previous uh, points were like kind of a bit of negative sides. However, the Burmese are you know, pretty smart in the way that they are easy to be taught and uh, they are easy to learn. Uh, they are eager to learn uh, if, they are, if, they are, if they are taught properly. So these are the good things, and uh, uh, but at the same time, many of the uh, young uh, workforce are also fleeing or getting out of the country for the sake of uh, better income to other countries. So uh, if if you are helping in the education and capacity building and uh, this stuff, I think it would be great, great uh, helpful to our people, to young people, not to have a brain strain. Uh, so these are these are the few points. On the other hand. Uh, if you can also think about in SMEs, the SMEs is uh, playing very important role in the uh, country's economy. However, the difficulty of uh, establishing the SME businesses in the country is very, very difficult, even though uh, the relaxation of the rules and regulation in the country has been, uh, has been placed. Uh, so we always encourage anyone who wants to invest in the, these kind of SMEs to uh, support these local people. Uh, and also driving them to the responsible uh, practices for our global uh, uh, economy as well as to our environmental conditions and so on. So, so these are these are the few points because the time is also ticking, and uh, I that these are the few points that I like to add. So I'll be happy to answer as well if you have any particular question. Thank you so much, Joshua. Uh, can I hand the reins over back to Sarah now? I suppose you have some questions already for our speakers, so you can direct them to uh, the questions to them. Thank you. Yeah, Hello, yes. I, can, I can see there is a question concerning the tourism, right? Um, yes, um, may I answer that, that uh, question from Kathleen? Sure, why don't you read the whole question for everyone to hear the question okay. and then answer. Yeah, I, I heard that uh, you have briefly touched on tourism, but I'm interested in knowing more about your thoughts on this. Overall, do you feel the increase of tourism is positive or negative to the country? Do you encourage people to come on these short-term visits? And if so, are there certain activities, organization, or otherwise that you would suggest or advise against? That was a question, and I would like to answer if, if, uh, if possible. Yes, yes, please. Because I, I work in the tourism industry uh, for the past 25 years. And uh, so I have seen uh, the good side of the our industry and the bad side of the dark side of the tourism industry as well. And uh, this is also uh, my kind of cup of tea that I like to answer to. The fact that uh, lately I've been asked also that what kind of uh, tourism industry do we foresee from private sectors or uh, for this country? Uh, to me, it's like uh, because it, it was a time that people were asking, do we want to have like high end uh, tourism development or budgeted travel or mass tourism? How do we feel about it? Because of right now, the, we are having uh, some crisis. The fact that the country is having so bad as an image uh, that people believe that this is not a good place to visit at this point. However, uh, the problem is the tourism industry is uh, feeding a lot of people. For me, uh, only in my, my different site projects, I have more, more or less about 400 employees. And uh, if I don't have, uh, if I have to shut down, that's more or less about 400 uh, employees that is linked to 1,700 uh, uh, family members. So this is just from one business perspective. We are not talking yet about tourism related others. So it, 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 
tourism money uh, usually come uh, mostly to the, the local community if you spend uh, money in, in less incorporate uh, kind of infrastructure. You can also use it. Of course, you are not discriminating against any big hotelier group. However, it employs so many people, but also it, it, when you are purchasing goods or when you are visiting the sites or when you use a local guide or local pro product, of course, there is a very good um, 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 benefit coming from the tourism. However, it is also is like a double sharpened knife. Um, it can also go very wrong because we also see in about how the tourism has brought up a bad um, impact into the local community, including in our own neighboring country. So we really would like to avoid. However, the problem is that sometimes we either we are very naive or sometimes we also look on the amount of money that people can bring to us directly. So sometimes uh, as a human nature, you don't really see what could be uh, negative impact. So there is impact, uh, negative impact to the environment. It could be also a negative impact, impact into the community or culture. So this is also um, need to be bear in mind. To me, I really wish that responsible traveler is the one that we really would like to focus on. Responsible traveler mean that you would try to choose even when you see it, when you go to a hotel and you see the menu of Norwegian smoked salmon and local, I don't know, dish, you will go for local dish, for example. You, you know that you will not be contributing the, uh, um, um, the carbon footprint when you're using the local product, something like this, just an example. To, to us, I, we don't, as, as we often said, that a, bugger, a beggar cannot be too choosy. The fact that as the, the, the tourism, um, uh, the quality tourism is, is kind of like not having uh, um, a lot this year. Um, some people ask, do we want to aim only for the high end tourists? We cannot choose high end or low end at this point because we, want, we, we need to have uh, enough tourists in order to, to feed, continue to feed our people. So it's not the size of the pocket we should be focusing how much people can spend, but what kind of uh, responsible traveler do we want? That is the message that we need to uh, speak out from the, our industry, but also from the, 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 the tourism ministry level. So to me, tourism can be good as long it's from both sides. If the tourists want to um, come and visit responsibly, that can be good. And it, it, if the developer or the people who work in the tourism industry like us, if we are responsible operator, this can be good. So to me, welcome to come and visit. However, please be aware, do not come in, in visiting when you are coming to the country. Okay, thank, thank you. A bit long. Yeah, sorry, because uh, it seems that we've got a lot of questions coming in now, so I'm going to pass it back to Sarah to ask the question. <laughs> Thanks. We actually have quite a few questions, so maybe if we can try to keep the responses on the shorter side. So I have a question here. What are some of the recommended projects to address the issues for conflict areas, particularly in Kachin and Rakhine states? Maybe Misu or Chasa, if you have a, an, uh, an idea of some of the recommended projects to address the issues for conflict areas in Kachin and Rakhine State. I will leave it to Misu. Oh, <laughs> okay. I just came back from Rakhine yesterday, so uh, I, well, I, my, my memories are stay fresh. I had a great time in Rakhine State. I'm so all, awful to say that I'm, it's not because I'm insensitive to what is happening. There are people uh, who are in trouble, definitely. But at the same time, I've seen. Uh, uh, I was walk. I was going to a, a group of uh, um, with a group of women talking about how to help this home industry and small weavers and small artisan in order to make sure that these people can stay continue to have an, in, an income generation and so on. So we had a little workshop and run in Rakhine, and uh, we ran it for three days. And I came back uh, last night. Um, what I want to say is that uh, it is important to be well informed before you come and visit. 
please try to um, go and uh, look at like uh, you know some of the links that you have um, in uh, in the uh, in the guidebook. Also, it, it show um, like Nyama Central for Responsible Businesses. They have a, a really good guidelines about uh, um, about uh, projects or. There is also one project called Myanmar Responsible Businesses, Myanmar Tourism in uh, Transparency Group, and these groups are, are like um, uh, uh, they give a lot of fresh um, recommendation and uh, good practices and a good area and good projects to support. So you can check those kind of links before you come. So please read and please do more research before coming. Just don't come quickly to click an Instagram uh, picture and post it. It needed to have more in depth and you won't regret it. The more you understand before coming, the better your trip will be. So um, for Kachin State, I know that a certain area is still uh, not available to travel due to the conflict, um, but the whole state is not in conflict. Like in Rakhine State, there is only three township out of 14 township. And Rakhine State is rather big and it's very, very long. So um, Please be safe, and safety is not uh, something that we, we we don't care. Safety is very important, not only to tourists, but also for the local people. So when there are some fight or some conflict area, of course, you were not going to go there, but um, Kachin State, there are many areas is safe. There are many areas that they won't recommend. Don't go there, the, the stay area where it is safe. So safety for you is important, but please read and please be updated before you come. That will be two recommendations that I would, I, would, I would say. But there are many projects, many small projects that are supporting responsible and uh, sustainable um, uh, tourism or uh, yeah, small businesses practices. Those small businesses and those small uh, artisans needed to have support. So please try to identify before you come. There are, there are many of them. Thank you. Thank you, Misu. So we have, I'm going to combine some questions um, for time's sake. So I'm going to read two questions that are about education. How important is the problem of corruption within the education sector? within schools? Are teachers expecting students to pay them? So that's one about education and corruption. And the other one is, what is the best use of donor money intended to address education? Is it working to improve the infrastructure or access to safe schools, working to shift the curriculum to a more child-centered approach and away from rote learning? So, I'm, uh, Dian, do you have, or Chao Sa, do you have any experience with education, either the curriculum or how uh, corruption affects education? I can try to answer if I may. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. The corruption is uh, deeply rooted in the country. Uh, it is simply because of the, uh, the poor education as well as also you, the lack of the, uh, uh, enough income into the, the government sector. So in the, in the past, uh, the uh, corruption was just simply due to the, the low, low salary. So they have to rely on the corruption. But later on, it has become a habit and it has become a kind of addictive too, and people ask for that. It has become like a business. So, uh, so education plays, uh, can play a very important role to, to, to minimize the corruption. Uh, so uh, we, are, we are running a private school. It is only two years, very, very, very young organization in the school, but it is also very, uh, challenging and also very good practices uh, we've been trying to do, uh, like uh, like you know the giving the gift or the uh, respect. It is very common in in our country culturally, and uh, in the very big days uh, annually, like two or three times, that uh, uh, the people they pay uh, present to the teachers. So we don't even allow in our school as a because we can uh, uh, regard this as a corruption. So we don't want uh, let we don't want to let our children uh, learn about the corruption since the early days. So this is one part. And uh, in the, in the uh, investment in the education part, uh, I see that it is going to be a very, very long process because all our teachers, like you know, those who were in the last two, three decades or the generations, uh, they all were uh, you know, gone through the very poor education system in the corruption system. And uh, so the mindset of this uh, socialist and uh, uh, monopoly and things like that are still still going on. 
So the good education system with the child-centered approach or the uh, uh, opening or the given the opportunity to think freely and to express freely, uh, this is very, very starting in our education and reform system. So the government is trying to do that uh, along the way. They have an uh, education and reforming strategy. Uh, however, uh, you, we have to be really patient and also we have to uh, uh, invest in time and the money and lots of uh, resources uh, to the uh, not only to the teachers but also to the parents because they, we, they all have to believe in that system and they have to work together. So to answer short, uh, it, it is like uh, less, uh, our belief in education and linked with the corruption. Thank you so much for that. I think we'll move on to another question. Um, can you describe the political situation and if the Burmese feel safe with the current government? Are foreigners and their help and expertise welcome truly or are there certain cultures more trusted than others to the average Burmese? Mm. <laughs> Go ahead, Yeah, I can. I can give a, 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 my my personal perspective. Um, um, to be honest, I feel like I'm living in a country with two government. One is the one that uh, people elected, and the one sitting in the office. However, if you really look at the Constitution, one can understand that um, most of the very important uh, ministries are under the management of the, the military. So uh, I don't know how they coordinate uh, each other, but uh, I'm not afraid of the government. Um, we, but however, we are very concerned about the, any, any given time the constitution, actual constitution, allow the army to take back their the uh, do the coup any time they want. So we hope that this government will be able to do. We understand that they have to do a certain compromises, but not by losing their integrity. Uh, in you know, but it it will be very challenging. We truly need to have a new investment in new new generation of leadership because our leadership is quite um, mature, uh, our quite old age and average uh, minister's uh, age is above 60 something. We all do respect for all these old people who has done a lot of sacrifice and choice, hard choices for this country. I think that it is also need to um, give a little chance to the next generation leaders who could eventually have more time and energy and more updated and can move faster. So to try to to answer to the shortest to the question, um, in terms of security, like every day for either for visitors or foreigners for, for us, I don't feel absolutely in danger. I'm not talking about conflicted area. Conflicted area, I don't live there, so I cannot talk on behalf of them. I am sure life is challenging in area that are isolated and there is no uh, 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 visibility or communication. However, now they, everybody has a phone and each time they have something, they always post it, everything on the on the Facebook, right or wrong. That is uh, something um, um, that we cannot verify. But what I want to say is that the only thing that I'm concerned as a citizen of this country is that any given time that the army can take back. And this is something that I don't feel absolutely comfortable um, about political situation. However, now they, uh, for the for the next term election, 2020, I think that uh, the different political parties, including the um, ethnic uh, parties are starting to uh, talk about and start to organize about. Next year will be quite interesting. This year and next year will be quite interesting. And uh, I think that there will be a, um, a lot of uh, uh, ethnic groups who will raise their concern and they will have a strong participation, a strong support in minority areas, which is not a bad thing, actually. However, we also are concerned that the, the, the other opposition party, or what we call it a USDP, uh, former military, we don't want them to win for sure. Um, so this is where the the, the political weather is at, at this point. Uh, for people who can eat three meals a day, we can think about it. But you know, but uh, those who cannot, maybe they are not thinking yet. 
it may come more at the latest moment. I I don't know if I cover your your the answer that you need. Thank you. That was excellent. Thank you. And we have one time for one last question. It's um, Myanmar is painted to be so complex. Does it mean that scalable scalability is an issue in Myanmar? Do you have recommendations on areas, sectors, strategies that enable scalability of positive impact on the people, on the environment? Well, uh, um, if I t if I can again give my my opinion, um, yes, what we need to do is like uh, to me, I see always as uh, the the way that we have survived is just do something that is that is impactful but measurable in a small scale fast to test try and if this is working then we can invest in long uh, bigger scale i don't dare to say like do it big and uh, immediately and then give high expectation inside out and then people got disappointed so i don't feel in general comfortable to do big projects and uh, and then it disappoint everyone so in general i like when projects are small scalable and measurable, and then you can see like this can be impactful because when it is small, it is like hard catching, not eye catching. So people feel more comfortable with that, and uh, then you, they get to know you. The local, then you need a local support, the government support, and then you grow. However, lately I'm thinking also opposite. Make it big because of people need so much hope. That's when a big project is coming, people feel like, oh my God, that was going to work. That that would be great. So that gives also hope and that is better that way sometimes. So depend which kind of area I would say. To me, we, I have started always small and then grew it a little by little. Our family business, for example, we started with five bedrooms. Today we have a couple of properties and this is um, this has been my my experience. However, I think also that certain project needed to scale it up big. Yes, you can start from one 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 uh, department of um, one uh, um, you know one step after another. But C is a big picture is also absolutely important. So it go it can go both way depending on which kind of project we are talking about. I don't know if this answer your question. Okay. Uh, hi, Sarah. I, I was just thinking of jumping in at this point um, since it's past 2 a.m. for Dian. <laughs> I, I was wondering whether, Dian, uh, you have any last comments also to wrap up, considering there were so many questions that came up to. Then we can wrap up uh, our discussion already. Yeah? I, I just actually wanted to answer the question uh, about uh, being a foreigner and, vis and working in Myanmar and whether it's safe. Um, I actually have been to Myanmar many times. The first time I went was actually a little bit after Cyclone Nargis in 2008. Um, and I've always felt comfortable. I felt the people were warm. Um, and I felt there was a lot of genuineness in wanting to learn. Um, so I would definitely encourage, you know, like, I think for me personally, it's safe and I will go anytime. I love going there. Thank you so much, Dean. And um, also thank you to Misu and Chosua, our very, very fantastic local partners on the ground in uh, Myanmar. Uh, last but not least, from our side, at least at APC, I'd like to um, drop everyone the link again uh, on the chat group on uh, where you can go to download the guide if you haven't already done that. Um, I think Sarah will also be sending that out to everyone who registered. So on from all of us at APC, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, over to you, Sarah. Thank you for joining us. And we also welcome you to join any other future WINGS webinars and hope to have another one with the Asia Philanthropy Circle. So thank you for joining us. And we'll follow up with an email to everyone who registered with a link to the, the recording and a link to the research. Thank you.